we all know of It's a Wonderful Life, right? Amazing Christmas story. So everybody else thinks. But when you watch another man, at least for me, when I watched George Bailey bust off at the bottom of the railing, this big ball, dude, I couldn't handle it. It was like an out-of-body experience. And so for me, it was just repulsive. It triggered stuff in watching it. I couldn't watch the whole. It's that same thing like that out of control rage. It wasn't who I wanted to be, but I knew that was who I was appearing as, how I was acting. And so in order to move through the anger, I needed to look at me. What were the things that I didn't like? What were the lies that I believed? And really start working through where does that lack of worth come from? Why do I feel special and not in a good way? Why do I feel like I'm showing up on the radar as the kid that's always picked on that doesn't measure up? Yep. You're just out of sorts. You're not normal. That was very much where I was at. And it was looking at those messages and beginning to ask questions. Because as I grew up, I was told, if you fail, that makes you a failure. Not a one of us wants to fail especially being considered a failure. So I'm playing small, Jay. I intentionally don't finish things. So mm -hmm. I'll start, but I don't finish because if I don't finish, mm -hmm. then you can't it, fail. You, yeah, exactly. You can look at it in somebody else and see the illogical pattern, but yet we live with those same kind of decisions. We're making those decisions because there's this self-criticism. I would never see you in that light but I would place that on myself so quick back then. And so it was working through all those beliefs, those knee jerk phrases, like, why are you such an idiot? Can't you do anything? That self-deprecating, self-critical speech. All right, Mike. Hey, man. Welcome to the podcast. I am so excited, number one, that you're listening. But Mike, I'm so excited that I get to introduce you to the group, to the other fathers out there. And I want to start by saying we both met each other a long time ago when we were both learning about podcasting. And it was so fantastic. And there's a funny story, and I want to cue you up to introduce yourself. And we can just kind of talk about how we met and how we maintain that friendship since then. So without further ado, Mike Forrester, everybody. Thank you, man. I'm super excited to be here. Absolutely. And, uh, going back and thinking about eating over ribs and just having an open conversation. Yeah. And I think that was what separated you and I, as far as becoming friends, was that we were both open to it. Okay. And so that's really what's fostered and driven the friendship that we have now, where it's not just, Hey, Jay, I need something on business. It's I need my friend. I'm struggling in this area. Or if I want to celebrate, I can call you and go, Jay, I just did this breaking those old habits. So yeah, man, it's been an amazing journey and I'm super blessed to have you as my friend. So thank you for inviting me to join you. No problem, dude. What habits, what, what habits are you talking about? What habits of which part? When breaking the habits, man, breaking the habits of thinking of relationships as just to summarize that of transactional versus building a relationship. What was the habit that you had? And then what is the habit that you've replaced that with? It's one of those <laughs> that, man, we all come in as guys going, I've got it together. And being able to, I think back on that night, just before before we had started into the event for talking about podcasting and learning was this is my background. This is who I was and being able to lay it out there instead of trying to scoot it under the rug and go, no, nah, I'm the dude with it all put together. None of us are put together. Yeah. It's just that facade. And so one of the habits, I don't, maybe it's a characteristic depends on how you want to look at it but is being open and genuine. Now, does that mean like inner sanctum? Oh my gosh, here's my deepest, darkest secrets. Not initially, 
but I was able to go to you and go, okay, Jay, I've struggled with self-worth. I've struggled with who I was as a dad, as a husband, as a man, and just at a basic level and test the waters, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't judge me. You didn't come back at me and go, oh my gosh, how could you ever? But being open like that, I would say that's one of the habits that has changed. Now, as you and I have developed our friendship, it's been one of being able to go to you and say, hey, Jay, this is what I'm wanting to do. This is where I'm at, how I see myself and being open and willing to receive your perspective and what, because how we see ourselves in a situation isn't always how somebody else is going to. We can color it because of the glasses that we're wearing, right? Our perspective or the thoughts that we've had ingrained, those beliefs. And so Jay, you've been brought up in similar ways, but you're a different person. And as long as I grant you that respect and I put myself in a place of being open to your response, your input, then it's, hey, Mike, did you realize that you're saying this? This old belief of yours is coming up in podcasting or with your kids or with your wife. And so that's been a new a habit that's been replaced. I wouldn't say it's necessarily new, but it's one I exercise is surrounding myself with men like yourself to say, speak into my life, guide me. I have a, a really firm belief here that when you care about somebody, you're going to interrupt them or call them out and reward and celebrate with them. So frequently our default relationships, and this is from our spouses to our kids, to work colleagues, to acquaintances on the street. So frequently they're that genuine, that authentic, that authenticity that you're talking about, that genuineness, that willing to show up, talk about what you want to create, talk about who you are, talk about what's going on, right? The idiom is, Hey, how you doing? I'm fine. Right. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Everything's great. Oh, I'm doing great. Are you? It's so funny when I think about the literature of emotional state, right? That like stress is created for being overly high and super positive, And then also overly low and super negative that we're actually built to be temperate. And I think when we're coming from that perspective of this is what I'm creating, here's how I'm being vulnerable using the catch term. So really what it's saying, this is who I am. This is what I'm creating. Do you want to come on this ride with me? And when we were meeting over those ribs that you made, still fantastic. I think about that all the time, that we were both in an environment where we were coming to build and launch something new. We were coming to learn and coming to that forefront and saying, I'm willing right now to learn what I need to do to have what I want in the world. And in the context of a podcast, it's these are the conversations I want to see in the world. And I think that that level can be applied to anything. I've been seeing a lot lately on Instagram is where I hang out the most. A lot of millionaires and people that have built seven figure, eight figure, nine figure businesses talking about how did they get there? And they say things like 70 to 80% are by referrals. The only way to get that referral, the only way to have that relationship, have that reciprocity is by saying, this is what I want to create. And that all comes from who I am. And it's been really easy as and I imagine this applies to you as well, that as we both have put in the effort and done the work and overcome, done the work as if it's past tense, as we're making progress in refining who we are and how we want to show up in the world, that we're naturally going to attract other like-minded folks. So I think when it comes to, and we were just having a conversation recently about this, about building that community, I'd love to hear your perspective on how you've adjust that habit, as you were saying, and are intentionally building a peer group or intentionally building a community around either who you are currently, what progress you're making or where you want to go. So the first step was changing me because I have to, like we were talking about, I have, don't, sorry, don't have to, I choose to be open and vulnerable to certain men. Not everybody is going to be trustworthy 
unfortunately, because of various reasons, right? For me, for a long time, I wasn't trustworthy because I wasn't stable. I wasn't secure. I wasn't mentally in that place. So that's where it's like you test the waters like you and I did that first night. You test the waters to see where things are, but it's unless I'm in a place to be open and honest and then put myself in a position of being open to receiving what's being said to me, I'm not going to build the kind of community that I want around me. The other thing is making sure that I'm working to grow myself and that I'm surrounding myself with other growth-minded people, not like-minded. Because Jay, if I had done that when I was in like that Eeyore phase, very victim mindset, destructive, angry kind of Mike, man, I would have just been in that misery loves company. That doesn't benefit anybody, (laughs) least of all us. I love this because I think anger is something that men... I don't want to say uniquely, but I think that the more and more that we listen to men that are coming out about what they're talking about, there's almost always an aspect of anger and whether that's self-anger, angry at themselves, right? That's, that's destructive or just angry at the world. I'd love to hear for you two things. Number one, what did it take or what did you do to acknowledge that anger? Because I think the first, I, and I'll cue that up a little bit more. As we are developing as men, as people, right? Emotions are things that are just states. They're ways of being. And I think under any sort of journey in this space, an emotion becomes, it becomes either fuel, right? In the positive sense, or it becomes a litmus test for how do I, like what's going on in the environment. Mm -hmm. At least that's my journey. My journey has been, hey, emotions are telling me about what's happening externally or internally. And then I can decide what to do with it from that perspective. So first, what did you do? What was the work you did around anger? And I'd love to hear transition a little bit away from the community about how that is, how that impacted your family, right? And then the decisions that you made to change that, because you have a fascinating story here about, well, I think it's fascinating. And I think that our listener, right? The feel good father out there is going to love what you have to say about this. So please go ahead. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. So as far as the anger for me came out of low self-esteem, low belief. My parents started with, you're not worthy. You're not going to matter. You're not going to amount to anything in life. That Those beliefs really created the foundation from which I worked from. And so I was never enough. And from that was where the anger came to the point where we all know of it's a wonderful life, right? Amazing Christmas story. So everybody else thinks, but when you watch another man, at least for me, when I watched George Bailey bust off at the bottom of the railing, this big ball, dude, I couldn't handle it. It was like an out of body experience. And so for me, it was just repulsive. It triggered stuff in watching it. I couldn't watch the whole, it's that same thing like that out of control rage. It wasn't who I wanted to be, but I knew that was who I was appearing as, how I was acting. And so in order to move through the anger, I needed to look at me. What were the things that I didn't like? What were the lies that I believed? And really start working through where does that lack of worth come from? Why do I feel special and not in a good way? Why do I feel like I'm showing up on the radar as the kid that's always picked on that doesn't measure up? Yep. You're just out of sorts. You're not normal. That was very much where I was at. And it was looking at those messages and beginning to ask questions. Because as I grew up, I was told, if you fail, that makes you a failure. Not a one of us wants to fail especially being considered a failure. It's so damaging because we know that success is literally trying and progress is defined by sequences of, of what you would technically call a failure. Yeah. Right. And I mean, so I'm playing small, Jay. I intentionally don't finish things. So mm-hmm. I'll start, but I don't finish because if I don't finish, mm-hmm. then you can't it, fail. Then, yeah, exactly. You can look at it in somebody else and see the 
illogical pattern, but yet we live with those same kind of decisions. We're making those decisions because there's this self-criticism. I would never see you in that light, but I would place that on myself so quick back then. And so it was working through all those beliefs, those knee-jerk phrases, like, why are you such an idiot? Can't you do anything right? That self-deprecating, self-critical speech. Yep. And so taking a look and not participating in that is the easiest way to say it, but it wasn't easy work. It was easy to see. It took a lot of effort and time right. to move through it and see myself differently. And it's still something I'm doing because there's so much that I took on that I didn't necessarily see readily in the beginning that it's like you're digging down, man. You just keep digging further and further in. But the amazing thing is I'm changing and it creates a space where I'm changing as I heal. It creates space for my wife to be who she's supposed to be for my children to see a different dad and not pass on that legacy of playing small, of believing that if they fail, they're a failure. It changes that legacy, that heritage that we pass on. And because I'm not intimidated or my worth isn't dependent upon my wife, not exceeding my ability or, you know, what I'm doing, we're partners we can work through. And I don't see her as an adversary. I see her as an ally, which is really what in a marriage you want, the kids are going to look at us. And if there's a secure marriage there, and that gives them a security at a, just a foundational level that changes the whole dynamic there. And it's amazing. I've been on both sides. I'll tell you, it's worth the work and effort, but it takes time to get there. But I could think of one specific story that you shared in the past, but is there anything specifically that you, or a specific time where you noticed that this was occurring, that there was an event or a statement or a conversation where you had put in the work and then somebody, now you're putting in the work, so you're focused on improving yourself. And then as a byproduct of you doing that work, of you managing your past, managing your internal messaging, managing your emotional state, that it created a more desirable result in your family. And that came back to you as a reaffirming, get some sort of acknowledgement of something. Yeah. So about a year ago, my wife walked across the stage to get her degree for counseling. Oh yeah. That <laughs> never would have happened before because I would have seen that as like an affront. I'm the man I'm supposed to provide. Why are mm. you doing this? You don't need to do that. Her getting a degree would just have been a threat in being healed. I was able to one, give her space, but also encourage her to continue the education. And when she walked across and celebrated, I was able to be the person that was yelling and cheering the loudest for her. And so she came back and said, I could not have done this without you, mm. dude. There is nothing like having the acknowledgement of your wife saying, hey, I got to this place of success because we're walking in this together and thank you. And that came from because you were able to turn, I'm going to use strong language, your self-loathing into self-love. And then that self-love started radiating from you and you're able to love on your family, love on your wife in a new way. And then because of that transformation that created the space and that security you were talking about, right? That security for her to be her best. There's another very specific thing, and I'll just mention it here. You have a podcast <laughs> and because you have your podcast and because of your journey in building that entrepreneurial pursuit, something else happened in your family that I think is also important for other, the other father here to listen to. Yeah. So one of my children, all my children are adults now. And it's one we can control our kids to a certain extent when they're young. We don't think about when they get older, they're going to have a mind of their own. And just as I left my parents, they can just as easily turn about and go the other direction. The interesting thing has been as a result of me healing and 
reconciling the relationship with my children, them being forgiving, is that one of my daughters, and I've got four children, one of my daughters is helping me as I'm coaching men. She's, I want to be on board. And she was the one I was pushing the furthest and the fastest away from me at one point in time. She's now walking alongside of me. The other thing is my son has now said, hey, I am considering launching my own podcast and want to get your input. Jay, there is no way that I would have ever held that space of being approached and asked, hey, I want your help in this aspect, in this area before. And the thing is, when we're a dad of young children, right, we're so focused on the immediate season that we're in. We're not going to stay in that season forever. The kids are going to grow up. Those kids go on to have potentially their own children. So now we're grandparents, we're grandfathers. If I had not healed, I would not have the place to be involved in their life, much less my children's lives. To have that trust, to have that trust and that love that your kids were able to say in the same way that we were talking before about how when we met, we were open to the conversation, we're open to the growth, we're open to create something together to share where we're at and what we're doing. You being open to that specifically to come and build a relationship at the podcast event was the same space that you held for the next person, for your kids, for your children to say, I want to do something as well. Right. And the difference is clear. One wants to encourage and help and be a part of a business, right? A coaching mentorship and mastermind business. And the other one wants to use their voice to talk about what they love and their passion. I, I don't know. That sounds pretty freaking amazing <laughs> as far as the turnaround goes. And here's the difference, right? When my worth, my value is wrapped up in how right I am from a conversation, mm -hmm. I'm going to argue until mm -hmm. I've convinced you, manipulated you, beat you up to see things my way and relent, right? I'm at a point now where I will take your input. I'll process it, consider it, but it's not impacting my value, right? It doesn't say, hey, Mike, if you don't do this, then you're not the man that you should be. My worth is not tied to me winning, air quotes, a conversation. And so I can have conversations and my worth, my value as two separate things. So we can actually have a conversation, have different perspectives. My kids aren't doing everything that I want them to or not want them to do. But that doesn't mean that I'm okay with everything. It also doesn't mean that I have to bully them into doing what I think they should be doing. Uh, right. I can respect them as they live their life and they still know, hey, yeah, dad doesn't agree with what I'm doing, but I know he's got my back. And that wasn't something that existed before. One of my values here that I've always held and somebody I had the privilege of being asked when my daughter was being born, what was it that I was looking forward to? And then in that moment, I said, I'm really interested in knowing what decisions she makes. And I knew that from way before she was born. So that's kind of just something that I took with me the whole time. And so one of the values I have is curiosity and then enthusiasm, right? As a family value, it's like, I, I want to know what you want to do. And then I want to cheerlead the heck out of whatever it is that you want to do. And then let's exploit that, whatever the activity is to the point where you decide yay or nay, this is what I want to do or not, right? I'm really curious about something here because there's some epigenetic research, some thought leaders are in the space that talk about how generational lines of healing start with one decision point. All it takes is one person to heal. And then that can infect both up and down. Did you notice from the relationship you have with your parents and your in-laws, right? It's a tempestuous and rewarding place to have. It's a rewarding relationship to have because they're going to be a part of your life, right? And you have an example of the relationship you had with your parents and the relationship they had with you. Did your healing here, did that go up the tree? Did that go up a generation? Has it, okay. So 
then well, let me let's... just you have the luxury of seeing my head shake so go right ahead so did the relationship with my parents heal i believe is what you're asking no to an extent it never did okay i was healing and went to them to try and reconcile they made the choice not to okay but they continued on their unhealthy patterns, which meant that I put in implemented boundaries to protect myself and my family. Right. My, both of my parents have now passed, but they chose to stay distant, to continue acting the way they wanted to be angry and continue that. So unfortunately, it didn't go up the chain as far as them then going, oh, hey, we can have an impact on our side. It did still create a space for my children to realize, Hey, things don't have to be parented the same. So I was going to say that there was a positive impact and that was the limiting of that influence. Yes. You know, it was, it was, absolutely. it was something that I'm really privileged and very grateful for to my mom for was that she made the conscious choice of knowing the environment that she lived in of really shielding my sister and I from that generational baggage from the messages. I remember she told me when I was older, she said, one of the things I specifically shielded you from was that pressure to find a woman and to get married really early. You know? Like that was just one of the things that like, I was never aware of the arguments at Thanksgiving dinner. I'm Canadian. So I, in October, the arguments in October and Christmas that were happening, or even the discussions where it was like, oh, does Jay have a nice girl yet? And I'm like, I'm in high school. <laughs> it, was, it was like, what's happening here? And I'm super grateful for that, right? And it's, I think it's a great place to discuss as fathers that we have to be intentional about, in the same way that you're intentional about the space that you're creating. What I heard was that you were intentional about the space that your line, that your generational line can have in your family. And in the same way that we're talking about how, when you're open and honest in a conversation and being able to create relationships that you're curating who you want. When you said, okay, you have to decide who you want in your life and who you don't want in your life. You're curating who your peer group is. You're curating that community. You almost have to do that with your family as well. One of my favorite thought leaders out there, Gary Vee, he just says, fire a loser friend, hire a winning friend, right? And I, there's a, a handful of distinct situations where he's like, look, if your parents suck, get out get out, go do your thing, go heal, surround yourself, heal yourself. Right. And because of the healing that you did in the same way for these other people that are breaking that chain and moving on because of the healing you did, it gave you an armor, right? You were able to acknowledge and say this way of being that I had when I was speaking poorly about myself had nothing to do with me had nothing to do with Mike. This had to do with them. Right. And the entire time you've been saying, I adopted that persona, I adopted that way of being and that other people that I loved were a threat to me. And so before I healed, I put them down. Now that I healed, I lift them up. I think that's absolutely fantastic. I think that the ability for any parent specifically to decide Yes, I want the parentage. Yes, I want the generational habits and generational relationships to extend to my current situation. We have the ability and the capability of making that choice. And it is definitely one of the hardest choices to make. Absolutely. Just a little bit of sharing for me. So background, because my father, my biological father passed and I didn't have a relationship after high school with him. So it was like the last time we saw him was like freshman high school. And by we, I mean, my sister and I, and last time I saw him was when I was a freshman in high school. And then there was no contact. And then when I was, when we were pregnant, I was like, oh, let's just reach out. Like, why not? And I actually found out that year that he passed, which was weird. I have this weird year in 2012 where it's okay. So I have lovely bundle of joy and love and affection coming into my life. And then that, I don't know, like that pit, that absence, right? That absence that, that exists there. But what I, decision that I made here was I never wanted to not be around. He wasn't around in, for my life, for any of my adult life. And so when I was having my daughter, I said, no, I don't want that. I want to be around. 
right? This, I want to break this. I want to be around. I want that relation to exist. I want it to be positive and healthy. I want to be curious about who she is because I realized that these are all things that weren't imparted to me from my father. And the fact that you were able to, the fact that we both did, right? The fact that not only that we both did, but I know that a lot of other fathers who are doing this work are making that same decision. It doesn't really even matter. Like we can even go into, it doesn't even matter what the relationship is, whether it's positive or negative, you get the choice. You have the choice about what you want. And not only do you have that, but you have the responsibility. All right. That's fantastic. What you've just said there is key, deciding what you want. Because most of my life, I had known what I didn't want to be. And that Mm. was exactly what I did become. I don't want to be like my parents. Guess what? I became my parents, but knowing what you want to become, Hey, who do you want to be to your children? Who do you want to be as a man, as a husband, having that North star is much more powering and driving than it is to go. I'm running away from these actions. this behavior is having something that you run towards and defining that as who do you want to be? The other thing that I would say in all of this, Jay, is that I did this for me. So not tying it to my children's responses, because that was challenging, especially in the beginning. I had trained my family to expect me to behave in a certain way. And as I'm working to change, they were still reacting to the way I would have been. If I had tied it just to them and how they were responding, I wouldn't have gotten through it because I'm looking for their response to be to how I'm acting now. And they're trained just like we were. They're trained to respond to us as who we've been. What are the specific, I love this is a great pitfall. What are the skills? What's the mindset? What's the skill? What's the methodology that you applied to separate out external validation for the progress in the work that you're doing that, that this is a critical, (laughs) critical skill set to have and acknowledge that people that we don't talk about, that we're not open about when we're actually doing the work. So what in your mind, what are those skills? One is this is going to go straight back to community. You need the external perspective because we're going to still see things through the filter that we've had. And it doesn't just go away and disappear overnight. And so when something doesn't go the way that you're expecting, your immediate reaction is going to be, this doesn't work, chuck it, forget it. I knew it wouldn't work. You've got those old beliefs and you're going to look for things to validate that belief. And so as you're changing, you need, whether it's friends like Jay or men around you that know you, that when you go, Hey, I'm fine. They call you out and go, that doesn't sound fine. I was really blessed with my wife seeing the effort and giving me that opportunity and saying, yeah, okay, let's go ahead and test this. That's not something everybody has the luxury of. I get it. Having other people around you, men in particular, I would say, because that's where you can lay it out without laying your emotional, sometimes like slime baggage, whatever you want to call it on your marriage with your wife, you can lay it on other men who are like, yeah, I'm not tied to you. How you feel is not going to affect how I like our marriage. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference in the relationship you and I have versus how my wife and I have a relationship. And I think that's pretty universal. Percent. I think that a lot of us that are down this path of personal development and self-improvement. How did I, a colleague of mine, a mentor of mine mentioned to me that your expectation of your spouse should not be the same that you had the expectation of your colleagues in this peer group, right? Your spouse is not your peer. They hold a different position for you. And that was transformative for me that for the longest time, I've always, I just lived in this space. Like when I was in eighth grade, I was reading this lesson prophecy, right? That's where I started on this self-improvement and certainly dated myself there, but self-improvement and uh, personal development, spirituality, right? Was just a big part of my life. And for a long time, I just, I had this expectation of my wife that she was going to do the same thing. And, and thankfully I had this different perspective of 
no, they don't need to. It's nice. But she's similar to you has occupied that cheerleader role mm-hmm. for me that she has always held the space for me to do what I need to do. And I've been privileged to be able to return that on occasion when I've been enrolled in her journey sort of thing. Let me phrase that more specifically. We have good boundaries with each other and she is able to tell me, yes, I want your help in this arena or no, I don't want your help in this arena. So when she doesn't want my help, I don't butt in. I'm like, sweet, great, I love you. (laughs) And so by taking that and I think then here, I think what we've done is we've done a really good job of talking about it, but I want to talk, want to go back to the skill. What's the specific mindset? Because I'd love for the feel good father to be able to take that tangible element from this conversation. What is that skill? What's it, I guess, what's the actionable behavior? What is it that we can impart to them together? Let's work this out. What can we do? What can we, what can we give them? (laughs) So I think one of the the vital skills is being patient and having forgiveness. I'm not saying forgiving others. I had the hardest thing of forgiving was myself being able to say, yep, taking the ownership. Yeah. You, you didn't do this well, but that's not who you are. That was what you knew to do and how you behaved. And so it's separating the fact of who I was yesterday, what I just did is not who I am. So as I sit here today, I actually use a framework called focus. Okay. So focus is the different areas of my life, both me personally, and then around me that I'm looking at where I want to be in the future, placing myself in a different position, because otherwise I'm going to sit here, Jay. And if it's a rough patch, right, work is going tough. My wife and I are not getting along. My kids don't respect me. I don't have that relationship. Dude, where do I feel valid? Like I, my worth in every area of life, man. And it just becomes overwhelming. You don't feel like you have a win, right? Okay. Yep. What am I doing productively? What am I doing You want to see that. So I will sit down and look at focus. The F is for family. So who am I as a husband? Who am I as a father? If you're in the same season as me, then add grandfather. Where am I within my immediate family? O is occupation. So work, whether it's self-employed or being an employee. And then also finances. C is my circles. So it's extended family, friends, and colleagues. How do I engage in those relationships? How do I appear in them? What am I contributing? The U is uplifting. So what am I doing that's growing me? What am I doing that's self-care? Because if we don't take care of ourselves, it's just like when you're on an airplane, please put your mask on yourself and then put it on your child. I need to take care of me to be able to give something. The last one in uplifting in you is fun. How many of us get so focused on goals and we forget, hey, I need to have some fun in life. All work and no play makes, you know, me a dull boy. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> and then the S is looking at the state. Like you've talked about mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. How do I want to be within those different areas? How do I want to feel? How do I want to think? If I'm not looking at myself and my life around me holistically, I'm doing a disservice to myself because I'm still going to have the pain. The siren's still going to go off in that area of life. But if I'm not giving it that attention, it's going to impact other stuff. So that is where I sit down quarterly and Maybe that's too often. Maybe it's not soon enough, but I sit down and I look and go, who do I want to be? What are my goals in this area? Okay. Where do I need to adjust? And at this point in time, I can take it to my wife and go, Hey, this is what I'm looking at for us. 
what is most important to you? Because I don't know if you've ever done this. You go to your wife and this is my task list and her task list does not match up with yours, right? So right. she has a different perspective and it's making sure that I take in her considerations when I'm looking at and going, where's the blind, the blinders at? And making and that's sure part that of the, sensitive to what she and the kids want. And that's part of the partnership. Yeah. That part of the partnership specifically for your spouse is about this is what I care about. This is what you care about. What's that Venn diagram? It used to be just a mic diagram. I don't care what you want. It's not right unless it aligns with mine. Yeah, a hundred percent. So when you're at runtime, so when you're active in the moment and also when you're in your reflective and planning periods, mm -hmm. right? Future planning, and then also reflective on what happened in the past, the specific skill is focus, family, occupation, your circles, peer groups, uplifting and fun, love that. And your state, right? Yeah. Your state, yeah. love that. I think Mr. Feel Good Father will have a lot of value from that, being able to leverage that. And I look at that stuff daily, Jay. I mean, it's because it's like, how many of us, yeah, it's a typical Monday. Oh my gosh, Monday was rough. You enter Tuesday and Monday's still fresh in your mind. If we don't have that bigger perspective of why we're doing it, just like the interchange, if I'm looking at my kids and my wife's reaction, if I'm looking in the immediate, I may not see the long-term objective, the reasons why I'm investing this effort and this time to make the changes, to become the better me, that feel good father, not the feel down father. Exactly. <laughs> That's perfect. And I think living in that space of the progress, right? It's the wonderful thing. We both have video games and tech, like as a background, right? Video games have this really great capability of giving as much sensory feedback as possible what's happening. It's one of the reasons why they're so addicting and influential. There's some other stuff going on, but we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 16 hours of video game. Yeah. Buttons yeah. being yeah. checked off on there. Uh, so yeah. And we can talk about we're going to come back to this in just a minute, but getting that feedback of too frequently, we're comparing what's happening today with ideal and even worse, too frequently, we're comparing my journey. And we can say this if, if you're listening, I compare my journey to everybody else around me. And I think that the self-love, self-acceptance, self-acceptance, maybe that we're doing and forgiveness that in the same way that we're creating the space by doing this deep work for others, we're creating the space for ourselves to be where we're at, right? We have to acknowledge the fact and allow the fact that we're in perfect works of progress, right? We are not, there's no destination in life. There's no perfect way to be a father. There's no perfect way to be a mother. There's no perfect way to be a kid, an adult, whatever it happens to be. There are guidelines and a lot of that's culturally motivated but on the individual basis, right? If we're allowing for the fact that, hey, this is who I want to be and authoring that, right? That all of those journeys are like this <laughs> to the destination. They're never a straight line. And that feedback is critical, right? That feedback is critical. And the elements of your focus method uh, incorporate a lot of that family, occupation and circles, right? Um, and then you have your consistent reward. So lovely, love it. Video games. One of the things as we're in this generation, I'd love to hear your take on this, is that we are, where we're at, we're really the first modern set of parents that have had the, they grew up in this particular climate. There's always been a new tech. That's not, I'm not trying to say that we're unique in the tech world. But we are definitely unique in the fact that we have technology specifically that is authored to create a feedback and comeback mechanism, whether we're talking about social media or video games for that matter. Video games more for men than, than for women. But I'm curious as another techie, because I, I certainly have certain things and certain boundaries that I've placed for myself and for my daughter now, and then I'll definitely be placing for my daughter coming. Because I'm, I'm going to be a girl dad, which is awesome. New daughter coming. About their use of tech and about them treating it not as a lifestyle, but as a tool. 
that's my perspective. What is your perspective on the space? I just shut off the internet and we just <laughs> put our head in the sand. <laughs> that's sure. so much easier, Jay. I, yeah. I, yeah, I see you as a Luddite. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, it has been one. I've used it inappropriately where it was the, when I talked about 16 hours, dude, I was medicating. I was right. escaping. Will it allow it? Yes. Is that the only way it can be used? Absolutely not. I've spent time with my children. I've got three daughters, one son. And I spent time as they were in their teens playing video games with them and being like, hey, here's Age of Empires 3. Let's go and have fun. Right. Yeah, yeah. And the worst thing I did was playing against them where it was competitive and fed my worth. The coolest thing I did was doing cooperative and playing right. with them and supporting them. Novel concept it'll relate back to life one of my think, oh go ahead okay i was gonna say i think as far as how tech shows up in each family mm -hmm. is gonna be just like how you talked about the uniqueness of the journey and so what works for one child in a family may be different than the next child we do have conversations with our children about their children and how much tech and everything like that, but it's just being a voice to it, right? As long as it's seen as a tool, fantastic. When it became comes this escape or lifestyle, uh, yeah, almost a dependency, right? I have right. to get on TikTok or Snapchat to yeah. to see what's going on. When the hits of the chemicals, like neurological chemicals, become the driving force then we have a different conversation. But as dads, we can be watching one ourselves to make sure we're not setting that example. Because if I'm at dinner and I'm on my phone and it's, I'm not engaged in that conversation around the dinner table, guess what kind of habit and acceptance my kid is going to see from me. So watching ourselves and then having the conversation, I think with the rest of our family is the place that I would work from to try and help them understand why not just dole out the rule and go, hey, you can't have more than an hour, but saying, hey, let's keep it to an hour and talk through the conversation of it and listen to what they do have to say. Am I saying that the child rules the roost? No, but let them have a voice because you are going to, at some point along the way, it's either going to be they're 18 and they're an adult and they make their own decisions, or you can adjust it so that over time they get more of a voice and they grow into that understanding that their decisions have power and how to think through things. And that wasn't something I was ever brought up with was that processing ability of make decision-making. That wasn't something that was a skill taught to me. So giving our children that gift, I think is something that that's powerful for us as dads to be in that place to do that. I'd love to talk a little about skill set or specifics here again, how did you, because your children are older than mine, and so you've been through a couple different cycles. So my daughter currently, she's in fourth grade. So she's starting to get that independence. And some of my work in language acquisition and doing ESL, I know that there are different, at her age, there are certain things that she can't comprehend yet because her brain hasn't developed in that way. The one, one core story I have is, is abstract rule sets, right? Like she's just not able to until kids aren't able to, until they get to high school to really understand an abstract rule set. And then the sequence of an abstract rule set, right? So they get, oh, this is a rule. I have to stay in the boundaries, but they, they can't extrapolate out, right? They can't figure out beyond the rule where it is. I'd love to have your perspective on what was the shift? I guess it's, yeah. What was the shift say for when they were younger and growing older as, a, as an applicable way to provide not only healthy boundaries in specific activities, but also healthy boundaries in developing decision-making. Cause I can imagine, I can certainly imagine a scenario where I'm enrolling or where we're enrolling our children into a decision-making process. And then saying, that's nice. Thank you. We're not going that way and seeing the resentment. And so for instance, one of the things that we did was that we had 
we have alternating dinner and movie nights. And so if the chores get done, if the work is happening, if she waits 15 minutes for the marshmallow, she can pick either what movie we watch and it can be a new one. So we'll rent or buy the movie or she can pick dinner. And that can either be something that we're making at home, either as a family or individually, or that we order in. So the reward happens after the work. I would love to hear very specifically, how did you encourage and create the atmosphere for your children to be able to make decisions for themselves? And then what happened when they, when you said no, what happened when you said yes? When you tear anything away, there's <laughs> always going to be that gnashing of teeth. And so that I think is universal. What we did was similar to how you're talking about there's requirements and expectations to then get this reward. We worked to say, okay, we'll give you a half an hour on this game. Once you get all these things done, pending that, you know, you're done by if it's one o'clock, let's say five o'clock. So we give them that deadline because there's also other plans and just saying, this is what's available to you. They get to make that decision. Do I want to do it or do I want to screw off? Then when they earn that time, being able to say, okay, you have a half an hour. These are your choices of what you want to play. Obviously, I don't want my four-year-old playing Call of Duty. So it's something yep. that's age appropriate and in that area. Then what we also did was as we get to 25 minutes in saying, Hey, just so you have a heads up, you've got about five minutes left and then it's time's up time to get off because playing video games or electronic tools, anything along those, they become immersive and we lose right. track of time. And then right. when I, as a dad come in and go, okay, time's up. It's like, it's a rough stop. Wait a minute. I haven't gotten to this level to save my character, whatever the case may be. So giving them some advanced warning and coming in to walk alongside of them where they may have lost attention, their attention in where time is. Um, the other thing as they got older was we would say, hey, as long as you get this stuff done, we're great with giving you seven hours a week, whatever the case may be. And so my son could then say, hey, I want to work with my friends to figure out when we can all go do this raid in destiny they could get together to go do something cooperatively yep. and so rather than you have an hour today you have an hour tomorrow you have an hour the next day he could say i want to save these up and use my three hours of time here to hang out with my friends Fantastic. what did you do for social media i'm particularly curious about this because i know yeah. kids nowadays that have no business being on social media being on social media and i'm not saying that uh the communication medium the communication media is at fault. We don't have to go there, but <laughs> for young kids, learning how to speak face-to-face -face is far more important than how they're going to interact through text. Again, this is that abstraction that we have a very difficult, our brain is not able to distinguish between the reward of a video game and the reward of real life. And this is one of the reasons why we escape into that space. And social media is the same way. As kids get older and they become more independent, they start building their own peer groups. How did you curate and place boundaries around or what, like what tools, what did you do here? <laughs> yeah. So what we chose and worked through was not always agreed upon. Ultimately we're the parents. I'm the dad. So right. there were friends that were more lenient that were like, why are your parents not let you watch this? Sure. We made a decision. We have been in, in two different places one place we were way too stringent. The other place we were considered way too lax. Right. It doesn't matter. Guess whose children they are and whose yeah. responsibility it is to raise them. It's mine. So with the social media, we, when they were, oh my gosh, like 12, we would let them have an account, but it wasn't on like a device that they had. We waited until they were closer to like 14. Now, social media was also at their at that time when we were raising them was not as prevalent as it is now. So let's just state that clearly, but it was still there. And so we waited until they were 14. They were able to do babysitting. My oldest three daughters, 
they were able to make some money. And so we got them a phone and curated like who they were seeing. Okay. That is challenging because there are apps that will allow people to hide stuff. That risk is always there. There were decisions that our children made and actions that they took that put them in dangerous places. We had one child that was being groomed to be trafficked. It's scary as heck. It doesn't, it, if they're hurting and they were at that time because I was as well, right? they're going to go looking for that same validation, that acceptance, that approval. And it doesn't always lead to great places. And so we started using tools that were like, okay, we can keep track of where they're at. You know, some people that's invasion of their child's privacy. Okay. That's your decision. It's one that we worked to respect them individually, but also protect them in their ignorance of what risks they're facing, even though you explain it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to, they can't abstract that out by it at that age. They can't imagine that scenario, right? Like about it, it when we were driving, you and I were 16, man, we get our license. Right. What's the first thing we want to do? Testosterone kicks in, you floor it. Yeah, go fast. We don't understand the risk of what we're doing both to ourselves or anybody else, because we haven't mm. had the time mm. in that seat. And it's the same thing with our kids. So it's a balance, man. And what works for me and my family in putting in the parameters and the safety apps and curating stuff at that age, I mean, I'll work for somebody else or I may be too lenient. I think what's really very important is that your position as the father was from a position of wisdom and experience and part of even part of education, right? We don't take a four year, we don't take a four year old's a bad example. We don't take a third grader and teach them high level calculus, especially if they don't know yeah. algebra, right? There's there, like the one teaching that. So at, at that stage in development, what the only thing they can really do is memorize what we're giving them. That's really the only thing that they can do, right? They don't have an understanding of the implication of what they're doing. And this is why education is split up that way. It's built in a way of proximal development, right? It's built in this construction of I'm giving you, I'm challenging your brain to develop a new pathway, to develop something new so that you're not overwhelmed. You don't just shut down. And I can imagine this world where we're putting this pressure on our teenagers and just saying, there's this wide freaking world out there of consequences bad actors, good actors, good relationships, well-meaning intentions that end up absolutely horrible that they're just not really able to understand and comprehend. And I don't bemoan any parent for whether they're being super strict or super lax in that environment. I think about, I think about the experience of the di different demographics in the world and the different environments of the expectations. I think about a lot of a lot of my black friends that talk about having sons, black sons, and the concern of just them surviving to the age of 30. I think about you talking about the sex trafficking. That's like my freaking nightmare. <laughs> right. Like now being a girl dad, even more, I'm just like, man. I want to not ever have to put myself in a situation or not have put them in that situation where this is a, especially at the age of the R, that this is a situation that they have to live through. But I think the challenge is phrasing these things in a way that makes sense. Right. And one of the mechanisms that I've used is I love from my background, I made video games. So my relationship with video games as we're in this discussion is fundamentally different. There was a time when I literally was sitting with my daughter when she was, would have been pre-K and kindergarten where I was building the game and letting her play it. Mm -hmm. And so I would just build a little platformer, which is just like a Mario. You're jumping, it's a 2D, you're jumping from thing to thing if you don't know the, the terminology and building that for her so that she could just hang out with me in the office while I was doing other work in Unreal. 
and just having that satisfaction, that relationship of this is a tool that you can create. And so for us, that pattern, and I'm running away from that really uncomfortable discussion about <laughs> child trafficking and bad actors. So that's just, it's awful, but it's awful that that's a world that we have to live in. But I think navigating part of that wisdom and experience that you're, you were bringing to your family that I bring to mine is knowing and acknowledging that like, it's not always roses and it's not always prairie land and that there are dark mountains that are spewing lava, like Mount Mordor, right? In Lord of the Rings, there are those things and that does exist. And I would much rather be a guardian and a steward and a custodian and freaking armor and fighting that fight than being the one that's chasing and going on a rescue. I'd rather be at the gate preventing it from entering than having to do an excursion out to go find. The movie Taken terrifies the shit out of me. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because our children are innocent, you know, mm -hmm. for the most part, they mm -hmm. have an innocence. And so my daughter, she loved people. And that was part of the problem of being distant from people. So it's a, it, it's really impactful at that point, but she always saw the best in people and took them at face value. So right. she's more vulnerable. That's the other thing is taking into account who your child is and what their behavior is. So when that happened, we sat down and watched, I want to say it was catfishing and taken to say, look, in real life, yes, you could tell the difference of somebody being dressed up and how they're appearing and everything like that online it's easy to put out a persona and say that you're one thing when you're actually something else or that your intentions are good when you know they're absolutely bad and they want to harm you and so it hurt to be dad that's presenting hey here are the dark troubles of the world right. but i would rather take that role and do that than lose them or have that risk of, yes, everything in the world is innocent and you don't have to worry about your actions having consequences with people who are looking to hurt you. What was the age? How old was she? If you don't mind my asking. She was 16 at that point. Okay. So she was at that stage where she's coming into womanhood and starting to have that traction with men in her regular life, in her regular Not group. For her. No, Not for her. That, not for her she's very sweet and innocent so it was okay like, i just want people but yeah yeah got it field of roses or field of flowers unicorns rainbows everything like that very sweet and innocent just that heart if you wanted anybody to have a heart for you it's her got it it wasn't so much looking for the guys as looking for relationship on got a it. friend level got it we ran into something really early where the language that I used was that same custodian, that guardian and how I enrolled my daughter in it. As I said, Hey, cause she played on my name, right? She plays on my name sometimes. And it was in this environment, you are the guardian of the house. So you have to be super intentional. I'm just trying to explain it to, she would have been first grade. I was really young when this was going on. And nothing malicious was happening. It was more just a, oh, you're having a conversation with somebody that you don't know online. And yep. it was about like, hey, don't give them address. Don't give them, don't tell them your name. Don't do these things. You have to, you're a custodian. You have to guard the house. This is your role now is that as you're able to interact with people outside of the house, that you have to be a custodian of the household as well. It's part of the responsibility. And she really reacted to that, into, into that, into that role. She was able to really enjoy that because it was one of the give a give a kid a responsibility they can handle and they love it. They'll thrive. That's why we let our young ones put the dishes on the table and why we let them put the soap on the table for setting the dinner table instead of cooking the complex dinner, right? Mm -hmm. When they're super young. That's enlightening to hear. So was there an impact long term? Is it how did you navigate that? And I guess the real question that I'm asking is that, did this have an impact as a father? How did you take this scary situation and maintain a positive relationship with men for your daughter? It was an interesting time. So I was still going through the healing at that time. I overreacted. Yes, I overreacted. <clears throat> okay. So 
our house became Fort Knox because I was like, ain't nobody coming through that door that's not approved, safe, anything like that. I was like, I'm not losing my daughter or any of my children. But we can do that without throwing off every alarm and creating a sense of insecurity in the house didn't convey that well. So I went into a very aggressive, assertive, the world is coming to our door and it's bad. Whereas if I had tempered it some and said, hey, yeah, this is somebody you ran across that wasn't safe. They meant bad for you. Could have handled it differently. Fortunately, my wife is my temperament. And so she was able to offset it immediately. It had some disheartening impacts for her. Sure. But as things calmed down and long-term, it was, look, there are fantastic people in the world. There are also people in the world that are not. They're evil and have bad intentions. And it was helping to give both perspectives that brought about the long-term health for her to see the world in going, Yes, I can go do these things, but I need to put certain safeguards in place. That's interesting because I think we tend to hang out in a place of there's either good or malicious. There's either good or there's no variety there. And I think from, if we're pulling in the learnings of the previous conversation, they can also just be selfish, right? People are innately pro themselves, not necessarily against somebody else. And I think in this situation, when we're navigating that space, and as we were talking earlier about that great lesson you had about curating your own peer group, right? See from focus, you're imparting part of that, like part of that focus method that you have, you were imparting that into your daughter and saying, hey, there's one of the negative aspects of curating your peer group is that you kind of always have to be not on your guard but you're always evaluating the people that want to enter into your circle, right? Because we always have a choice of who comes in and who doesn't. And I think that's very empowering. It's also from that place, Jay, there was a lot going on that wasn't, like I said, that was during the initial changes and everything going on there. So my family was in a bad spot because I was in a bad spot. I'm hurting, I'm navigating them through pain. And so they're looking for some enjoyment they're looking for fun in life to be okay rather than going through the pain with dad and so part of it was working through it together yep. and just saying as i'm healing giving her validation yes you have worth this is not a reflection on you these people are looking for opportunity and they're going to learn to manipulate it. Just like I've manipulated you, they're looking to do the same thing. Right. Bring about the things that she has experienced from me or seen in movies or whatever that is part of her experiences helps mm. to then paint that picture. Whereas not everybody's bad, but you need to be aware. You need to be right. aware of where you are at that time. And then the people around you and your surroundings, you got to be I wouldn't say vigilant, but you have to be discerning. Right. hundred percent. Let's talk about fun. <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about celebration and bringing some great things in here because fun, especially for our children, the fun, the vacation, the, whatever it happens to be that uplift, right. They'll, they're going to attach equally to those moments as they will to the negative experiences. So what did you curate? What did you curate specifically? for fun for your family as a father? So for us, it was random things. If we were up at 2 a.m., we might go to IHOP and just get dinner sure. to do something. And that's not every week, okay? That was just, let's go do something different because everybody's up a type right. deal to create those memories. We would have snowball fights in the summer. Now, okay. what we did was like the, not the giant marshmallows that are like palm size, but the ones that you would put on a s'more. We would get those and everybody in the family got a bag of marshmallows. Okay. And then we would go ahead, 
get away from the big screen TV, make uh-huh. sure it's a safe room. Yeah. And we would have snowball fights by throwing marshmallows at each other in the middle of summer. Sure. Now, well, one of the crazy things is you will six to 12 months later, find a marshmallow under the couch that is rock hard. So yeah. be ready <laughs> to find them where you don't expect them. Yep. Yeah. At this point in time, we have moved to where once a year, we're getting our family together and going to do something local that it's like, okay, four hours away, we get away for a week. So we're coming together right. and every other year doing a bigger trip. Okay. But interspersed, I've also giving my children one-on-one time. Sure. So we would have date nights. Yeah. Uh, I would go out with my wife one week. The next week I go out with one child. Then I go out with my wife. Then I go out with another child. That is dependent upon your ability to find somebody as a babysitter, obviously when they're younger, but if you're building your community, you can usually find somebody else that you can trade out. So it doesn't impact your finances will impact your time. There's going to be some give and take, right? But creating those memories. Now, here's the funny thing, Jay, before I healed, we lived in Idaho. And the only thing that we could afford was to go camping because we were a one income household. Yep. So we would go camping. My kids are loving it. They still to this day revel about those trips. Yeah. The thing that was going on in my head at that time, Jay, I'm a sucky dad because I can't afford the trip to Disneyland. Yeah. I'm broke. I didn't amount. And yet my children are having an amazing time. So it's not so much creating this wonderland event as creating a memory. So give yourself the space to create the memory and be the dad who's doing it without having to have that, that Pinterest expectation of here's this marvelous event. Our kids just need the time, like that refresher. It's just getting that validation, creating those memories. You don't have to worry about it being opulent. So take right. a chance, give yourself the space to do that. Got it. So Mike, if folks want to follow up with you and find out where you're at, where can they find you? Highcoachmike.com Got it. is the best place to find me. Like you said, I have a podcast living fearless today. And the focus is helping men who have come or are coming through the struggles that I faced. Right. your anxiety, depression, self-worth, who want a better life to realize just like you're doing here. I'm not the only dad that struggles with being a dad. You know, right. we all do right. it, but unless we have that community, we think it's just us. That would be the best place to find me. You'll find my social media tags there. You'll find the podcast hosted as well. So awesome. I coach Great. Thanks so much. This has been lovely. <laughs> I had a really great time. Just thanks for coming on the show. And I know that we'll be talking soon. Yeah, my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Jay. Awesome. Hey, feel good fathers. Hit that like button to let YouTube know that you liked this video. Comment below with your thoughts and reactions to this interview. I really want to hear what you have to say. Now, as a personal brand strategist, I hear all the time about coaches, trainers, speakers, and authors doing the right thing but at the wrong time. We specialize in helping brand builders have more impact, more credibility and clarity and developing an overall brand strategy. When you work with Brand Builders Group, we'll help you do the right thing at the right time. Request a free brand call below. There's a link in the description. And don't forget to subscribe. You'll get updates when the new episodes are launched and it really helps out the community and the channel. We'll see you next time.